opioid crisis. President Trump declares a nationwide health emergency. We're at the White House with his plan of action. Thrilling on Capitol Hill. It's extremely troubling to me, Mr. Lloyd, what's happening. I think you're far overreaching over your expertise or your jurisdiction. Democrats cross-examine a Trump appointee who tried to stop a detained immigrant teen from having an abortion. Christian persecution. Vice President Mike Pence vows the Trump administration will work with faith-based groups, not the UN. And out of this world. Pope Francis greets members of the International Space Station. We'll have a report back on Earth with Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, October 26, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump declares the opioid crisis a nationwide public health emergency, calling it the worst drug crisis in U.S. history. 142 Americans die every day from overdoses. White House correspondent Mark Irons joins us now. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. This declaration won't mean extra funding from the Trump administration. President Trump is looking to Congress to add new cash to the fight. But the president is proposing a massive advertising campaign to tell young people to avoid prescription drugs. We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. We can do it. President Trump unveils his plan to solve America's massive drug addiction. That is why, effective today, my administration is officially declaring the opioid crisis a national public health emergency under federal law, and why I am directing all executive agencies to use every appropriate emergency authority to fight the opioid crisis. The president will expand access to medical services in rural areas and shift some federal HIV money to help addicts. In 2016, 2 million Americans were addicted to opioids. Today, I spoke with a former addict who is now recovering. Dan Stindeback of Noakesville, Virginia, is a Catholic father of two who first started taking OxyContin after experiencing back pain. That led to heroin and a downward spiral. Dan says the drugs made him a prisoner. It led me so quickly to trying heroin because somebody told me it's like it's pretty much the same thing and it's cheaper, you know? Um, I didn't realize I was physically addicted to it until I stopped taking it. Um, then it really started, then it was just like, whoa. Dan has been in and out of jail for the last two years. Now he's getting help from Catholic Charities of Arlington, Virginia. Catholic Charities has helped me secure housing through Oxford House. Um, they're helping me find a job. Um, they've connected me within the Catholic community, which is what I wanted and what I was before, but you know, I needed a, a fresh start. And Dan says his faith has been key to his recovery, and he's placing his trust in God to get him through. Tackling this issue from another angle, the FDA is imposing new requirements on manufacturers of prescription opioids to reverse a trend of over-prescribing. Over the Trump administration says that has been fueling the crisis. Lauren. Mark, this isn't a new problem. Has government funding addressed this epidemic before? Almost a year ago, Congress approved an extraordinary $1 billion to uh, tackle the opioid crisis, but it's taken time for that money to get to the people who need it in all 50 states. In some areas, the funds are just now starting to trickle in. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you. Coming up uh, later in the program, we will discuss the president's announcement with a physician and policy expert. An illegal immigrant's abortion leads to a fiery debate on Capitol Hill. Lawmakers confront the Trump administration official at the center of the case. Correspondent Jason Calvi takes us inside this contentious hearing. Did you have direct contact with Jane Doe or those who are advocating on her behalf? I, can, I cannot comment on individual cases. Democrats grill the Trump administration official who tried to stop an abortion for a 17-year-old illegal immigrant. Mm -hmm. Have you ever contacted any anonymous young girl in, in your care oh. trying to talk her out of uh, having an abortion? I'm out in the field in, in it, 
many of our locations, and we and I meet with you know dozens and, and even perhaps hundreds of, of the po people who we serve, the populations we serve. And so um, among them, I'm, I'm certain that some, some of them were pregnant at the time. I'm disturbed that we won't answer the question. Scott Lloyd's testimony to the House just happens to come one day after the abortion. He's the director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement and a former employee of the Knights of Columbus. Do you believe that a woman's constitutional right to abortion depends on her immigration status, yes or no? A number of uh, rights. Uh, that is not a yes or no question. That is not a yes any, or no answer, well, Mr. My, my answer is that any number of rights depend on um, the, where they stand in, in terms of our immigration system. I do not understand that answer. Is that a yes or a no? Representative Steve King, a Republican who's Catholic, turns the tables and tells me. Democrats on this panel and all across this country were celebrating the taking of an innocent human life of that child. Their argument was it was justice for, for Jane, Jane Doe, in this case. And of course, the baby has no voice in this, and they just declare that the silent then, there's no injustice to the silent. The ACLU launched a petition to urge Scott Lloyd to allow immigrants in his custody to get abortions. And today they say they delivered tens of thousands of messages to his office, urging him to support their abortion argument. Lauren? Jason, I see that Priests for Life is defending Lloyd. Executive Director Janet Marana tweeted that he's a stand-up guy. Lloyd once wrote in the National Catholic Register that our country should demand no taxpayer funds go to any groups that provide abortion. Uh, he also had some emails that were released by the ACLU. He said he'd offer to find a few good families to help one te uh, teen with pregnancy to get through her pregnancy. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi, thank you. The House narrowly passes the GOP budget, setting up Congress to fast track a tax reform bill. It comes as the U.S. bishops remind members of Congress to keep the poor in mind. In a letter, Bishop Frank Duane writes, as the country wrestles with how to best raise adequate revenue to serve the common good and provide increased financial stability, you are urged to recognize the critical obligation of creating a just framework aimed at the economic security of all people. The Trump administration settles lawsuits with Tea Party groups over IRS targeting. Under the Obama administration, these groups seeking tax-exempt status received extra scrutiny. The settlement includes an apology from the IRS. Vice President Mike Pence announces the United States will provide direct aid for Christians and other religious minorities facing genocide in the Middle East. Mr. Pence laid out the new policy last night at a summit on Christian persecution. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby joins us with details from the State Department. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Vice President Pence says President Trump is ordering officials here at the State Department to stop funding relief efforts for Christians through the U.N. Instead, Pence says the U.S. will now give funding to religious minorities through USAID, the government agency that gives international aid. The United States will work hand in hand from this day forward with faith-based groups and private organizations to help those who are persecuted for their faith. This is the moment. Now's the time. Vice President Mike Pence promising to defend religious minorities persecuted by ISIS. Pence made the remarks at an annual summit here in Washington on Christian persecution. He'll be visiting the Middle East in December, and the vice president says the U.S. is shifting funding away from what he calls ineffective U.N. programs. Here's the sad reality. The United Nations claims that more than 160 projects are in Christian areas, but for a third of those projects, there are no Christians to help. Pence says the faithful in the historical Nineveh Plain in Iraq are living in makeshift shelters. Her own Lauren Ashburn saw the unmet needs firsthand when she traveled to the region in April. The Archdiocese of Erbil houses hundreds of refugee families without any American aid. Completely destroyed. So far, most foreign money has gone to UN refugee camps, but Christians and Yazidis are afraid to go there for fear of persecution. The Knights of Columbus Supreme Knight Carl Anderson applauds the vice president's decision. His group is one of the few on the ground that's helping displaced Christians. The world witnesses again and again crimes against humanity that we now describe 
as genocide. Today, that word is rightly applied to what is happening to Christians and other religious minorities in the Middle East. And we are grateful to the Knights of Columbus for supporting this program as well. Vice President Pence says the majority of the millions of dollars the Obama administration donated did not reach the religious minorities it was intended for. The State Department first declared what is happening a genocide in March of 2016, but Christians have not seen any direct aid. Lauren. Why, when I was in the Middle East, Christians who had fled the Nineveh plane were afraid to return to their homes. Is it safe for them to return now? No, Lauren, unfortunately, it's, it's still not. There are still pockets of ISIS resistance in both Syria and in parts of Iraq. And tension is also high between the Kurdish area of Iraq that's in the north as well as the government in Baghdad. So that area remains really unstable for the ancient Christian communities. Lauren. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the State Department. Thank you, Wyatt. At least three people are dead, 25 injured during protests in a repeat presidential election in Kenya. Opposition supporters clashed with police, forcing voting to be postponed in areas affected by violence. While most of the country was peaceful, voter turnout was low. At least 47 are dead, 46 injured, following an explosion at a fireworks factory in Jakarta. Many of the dead are female workers who apparently were locked inside the building. The death toll could rise. Many who escaped suffered extensive burns. Pope Francis welcomes a delegation from the Church of Scotland to the Vatican ahead of next week's 500th anniversary of the Reformation. During the meeting, Pope Francis said Catholics and Protestants should thank God for being able to commemorate the anniversary as brothers and sisters and no longer as enemies. Next week marks 500 years since Protestant reformers led by Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church. Faith in space. Pope Francis becomes the second pope to talk to astronauts at the International International Space Station. What gives me the greatest joy every day is being able to look outside and see God's creation, uh, maybe a little bit from, from his, per his perspective. People cannot come up here and see the indescribable beauty of our Earth and not be touched in their souls. That was American astronaut Randy Bresnick telling the Holy Father what brings him happiness more than 200 miles above Earth. Juliet Lindley is EWTN News Nightly's Vatican correspondent. She joins us from Rome. Hi, Juliet. Nice to see you. Thank you. Tell us about these astronauts the Pope spoke to today. Lauren, the link-up was a live link-up. It lasted about 20, 25 minutes. And the pontiff had five questions for the astronauts. Now, there were six astronauts from different countries, three American, two Russian, and one Italian. And the Italian astronaut, uh, Paolo Nespoli, was the main interlocutor speaking in Italian with the Pope. And the Pope was in a little room inside the Vatican, sitting at a desk, looking up at a screen. And in front of him, you could see the six astronauts up in the space station. The Pope talks to space. What did he say to these astronauts? And what did they tell him? His questions included uh, whether love is the force that makes the universe move, what gives them happiness when they're up in space, and for instance, how they cooperate amongst themselves. So on the question of love, one of the Russian astronauts said that he's been reading The Little Prince and that love is indeed the force that gives you uh, the strength uh, to give your life for someone else. On the question of uh, cooperation, the Italian astronaut said their spirit of cooperation was very, very strong, and that uh, they as a team were so much stronger than themselves as individuals. And uh, Joseph Acaba, the American astronaut, said that the space station is a great example of international collaboration. I love this story. I just think it's so good that the Pope is sitting in this little tiny room, and he's talking to these astronauts about love. But he wasn't the first pontiff, uh, isn't that right, to make a call into space? Have we been in space before as Catholics? Absolutely, absolutely. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI made a similar phone call uh, six years ago to the International Space Station. That was in 2011. And he asked many questions, many of them about the planet, about the environment, and about what risks the planet faced. And if you want, we can go back even further to 1969, when um, Pope Paul VI blessed 
the voyage of Apollo 11, and he said he would keep them in his prayers, and he even went out to Castel Gandolfo, to where the Pope's country residence is, and he looked through the telescope because he too wanted to be amongst those throughout the world who wanted to see the first man to set foot on the moon. And wanted to be amongst the stars himself, I guess, in some small way. That's wonderful. Thank you for this great story. Juliet Lindley, EWTN News Nightly, Vatican Correspondent. Thank you, Lauren. Coming up, the opioid emergency. We'll ask a doctor and policy expert about the president's declaration. And releasing the JFK files. Will new information about President Kennedy's assassination put the end to conspiracy theories? President Trump is being coy about what is in the long secret JFK assassination files. The National Archives are set to release them today. The collection includes more than 3,000 documents about the death of John Kennedy, the only Catholic U.S. president. Earlier, we reported on the personal tragedy of opioid addiction and how it impacted a Catholic family's life. At the White House today, President Trump signed the declaration to address the opioid crisis. He said it's ripping the nation apart and that he will be pushing for the concept of non-addictive painkillers very, very hard. We welcome to our program Dr. Anad Parikh to is that correct? That I think I've correct. got that yes, right. The yes. chief medical advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And you were uh, at Health and Human Services before that as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health. Is this a good thing that we are seeing this declaration or do we need even more? Well, this is a national emergency. 33,000 Americans are dying every year from opioid overdoses. Two and a half million Americans are addicted to opioids. So this is a national emergency. But beyond the sig symbolic significance here, I think today's declaration is, is important. There is one thing that it doesn't do, however. It does uh, allow the executive branch to draw upon the public health emergency fund, but there's no money in that fund. <laughs> so over the next couple of days, it'll be interesting to see if, if President Trump calls on Congress to appropriate more money. I know that earlier uh, in the year he appointed Chris Christie, I believe, to look into this and to, to start uh, really making some inroads in this. What I understand about this declaration is that it's going to make it easier for states to receive Medicaid dollars to treat individuals with severe addiction who need inpatient drug treatment. As a medical professional, do you think that is important? There are some Americans out there who are, who are really facing severe addiction, and they can't really benefit from just outpatient therapy. And so what this declaration would do is really lift the exclusion. So inpatient facilities that have more than 16 beds can actually get Medicaid reimbursement for, for, for treating patients. So this is really important for states, and it, it's probably a good thing that it was in the declaration. There are some numbers that um, we found here that are just devastating. In 2014, the number of babies born who are drug dependent increased by 500 percent, and that's since 2000. Children are being placed in foster care a lot, I would imagine, be because of this. Um, What's this new initiative going to do to help these new babies? Well, the president and the first lady talked about this. And in fact, today, the Bipartisan Policy Center issued some recommendations because this issue of children in the opioid epidemic uh, is not really talked about. And in fact, children are impacted by the epidemic either through prenatal exposure to opioids or through their families where substance abuse disorders take, take place. So just a couple more statistics. Every 25 minutes in this country, a baby is experiencing neonatal abstinence syndrome. They're withdrawing from opioids. And in terms of the foster care system, one in three new foster care entrants are entering because of substance abuse disorders. So we'll have to look at, at the fine print here in terms of what the declaration specifically does, to the, uh, uh, does for this issue. But the Bipartisan Policy Center today issued a new report highlighting that very point. And we can take a look at that and find that at? At, at, uh, bipartisan, at the Bipartisan Policy Center's website, bipartisanpolicy.org. Okay. Yeah. .org. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Dr. You so Anad much. Parikh, Chief Medical Advisor, Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you. A debate is brewing in Canada over government funding for sex education in Catholic schools. Catholic institutions across the province of Alberta are drafting curriculum that stays faithful to church teaching. But 
Alberta Premier Rachel Notley says, quote, we will not use public dollars to have sexual health programs that deny science, deny evidence, deny human rights. The Calgary Herald says Catholic schools received roughly 70 percent of their funding from the government. Up next, a new pro-life bill in Congress. We'll talk to its sponsor and sacred music at the Sistine Chapel. The Pope's Choir prepares for Christmas. Cristiano con la forza di Cristo, cambiare, questa è la conversione. Pope Francis says that his daily mass in the Vatican, there are pills for sleeping, but not for inner peace. He says only the Holy Spirit can give peace to Christians, and we must make room for him in our hearts. The student union president at the University College Dublin faces impeachment over her decision to remove information about abortion from the student handbook. Students voted this week whether or not to remove pro-lifer Katie Askoff as student president. We are still waiting for the results. Askoff claims she received legal advice before removing the abortion language. Pro-life groups say activists are trying to censor their views. The House of Representatives is considering a new piece of pro-life legislation. It goes after the abortion business, not from a medical standpoint, but instead it seeks to stop abortion providers from using tax-exempt, taxpayer-backed bonds for abortion clinics. Mr. Speaker, today I introduce the No Abortion Bonds Act to end federal taxes and bonds that support abortion providers. Under a loophole in the current law, cities, counties, and states can issue federally tax-free bonds to finance construction of abortion clinics. That's Congressman Robert Pittenger of North Carolina. He introduced the bill yesterday. He says the legislation applies the spirit of the Hyde Amendment, which prevents federal funds from paying for abortions. Congressman Pittenger joins us now from Capitol Hill. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be with you. How does this new pro-life bill prevent abortion clinics from being built? Well, under the current law, there's a loophole that allows uh, for a tax-exempt bond to be sold and uh, to help build an abortion facility. And this will not allow that to occur uh, any longer. Uh, there are some exemptions. There are hospitals that are exempted. But, you know, these taxes and bonds are really important for infrastructure, for schools, for hospitals. But certainly uh, we didn't have it in mind to allow them to be used to help build abortion facilities. Tell me how you found this loophole in the taxpayer system, which allows taxpayer money to finance abortion clinics. Well, as we worked through the tax bill, uh, we just uh, identified the, the reality that there was a loophole there. And then we started researching and found out, that, for example, that in New York City, uh, the Planned Parenthood renovated a, a major building, their headquarters, with a $15 million uh, tax-exempt uh, bond. It was in a $30 million renovation. Uh, three years later, it happens that they sold the building for over $60 million. But taxpayer uh, exempt bonds were uh, used to facilitate that renovation. Elsewhere around the country, they've also built facilities utilizing these tax free bonds. Your legislation, though, is a standalone bill. You have 50 members of Congress, including one Democrat, who are the co sponsors. But if you don't get the support, are you willing to incorporate this legislation into tax reform? Absolutely. We're working on that now. Uh, we're, we're, you know, they, they don't want to uh, put a lot of other additional aspects on the tax bill because they want it to ride through as easy as possible. But we're pushing real hard. And we've got three members on the uh, Ways and Means Committee who are already sponsors on this bill. So we've got a lot of support. Do you want to give me a, an idea of uh, the likelihood you think of this passing? I think we have a good likelihood of it passing, whether it's uh, on the appropriate on on the uh, tax bill or a standalone bill. I think there's a lot of support. The American people support it. There's a Maris poll conducted uh, uh, recently that showed that 62 percent of the American people oppose uh, federal funding for uh, for abortions. So this is consistent uh, with what we have done in terms of our not funding abortions uh, with taxpayer money. 
All right. Thank you so much for the update and for joining us on the show. We look forward to having you back. Representative Robert Pittenger of North Carolina. God bless you. Thank you. Tonight on EWTN's Pro-Life Weekly, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton tells Katherine Zeltner the recent case of an illegal teen who received an abortion could lead to taxpayer-funded abortions for undocumented immigrants. The next case will be a tax-funded abortion case, and we'll be arguing about whether taxpayers should be paying for abortions for people who enter our country illegally from anywhere in the world. I, I can almost guarantee that case is the next case. You can see more of Catherine's interview tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. It re-airs Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Finally tonight, the Sistine Chapel Choir is out with a new CD, just in time for Advent and Christmas. <laughs> Pope's Choir provided a sample of that music this week at the Vatican. This is the third year in a row it has released a CD. And the music featured in the album includes unique scores from the Vatican Library manuscripts. You can learn more about the album and the choir right now at our news partners, catholicnewsagency.com. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless you.